Good evening. Good evening. It is that time on a Wednesday night, so we are at 6.30, well, Baptist time, I guess we're right on time at 6.31, but uh, it's good to have you with us on this Wednesday night as we continue uh, in our study of Amos. Chapter 3 is where we're going to pick up here in just a few moments, um, and so we're going to continue to read through. Uh, and learn more about uh, the message that the prophets have for us. So let's open up in a word of prayer, and uh, we'll dive in, and we'll get started. So Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for another opportunity that you've given us to come to your house and to worship you and to honor you, and I pray tonight that uh, we would uh, continue to learn more about you as we open up your word and study uh, about these prophets, particularly Amos, uh, and the message that you gave him to declare and proclaim. And so, Father, we ask that as we open up your word that you would continue to shed uh, uh, light and truth as we uh, continue to learn. Uh, Father, may our hearts be able to, and our minds be able to absorb it. And Father, uh, may we not just absorb it, but may we then take what we've heard and live it out each and every day. Uh, to be an example uh, for those that we come in contact with. and uh, Father, we never know uh, when we come in contact with someone uh, what that uh, appointment is and for what reason. So, Father, may we uh, truly uh, step out in faith and honor you and uh, be an example uh, of what Christ has done for us uh, as we continue to reach the world. In thy name we pray. Amen. All right, so... Uh, we're in, uh, as typically I do, uh, we uh, will review. So here's the easy question. What book are we in tonight? All right, good. So we got you one point on the board. That's good. Um, and so we're in chapter 3. Uh, and as we've been studying, uh, is the message of a prophet typically a popular message? No, yes or no? No, okay. So the majority of the room says no. Now, why? is the message of the prophets, not particularly Amos, I guess, as we're talking tonight, not a popular message. Well, he tells them how evil they are. Tell them how evil. What else? Judgment. Punishment. What else? Repent. Disobedience. Yeah, so all those things combined that don't typically make a how to live your best life now type message, right? So you typically don't uh, hear uh, the positive message um, when the prophet comes to town. It's typically there's a very specific reason. He is there. All right, so let's back up now. Amos, we know he grew up in what town again? Tekoa, right? Tekoa was how far from Jerusalem? Well, is it seven, eight, or ten? Ten. Ten, okay, very good. Ten miles, that's right. And then Jerusalem is, where did, where did Amos go uh, as he crossed through Jerusalem? He went to what town? Bethel. Bethel, very good. And Bethel is how far from Jerusalem? 21 miles. Okay, so oh, you're... Rugged terrain. Rugged terrain, so not quite as the crow flies. As the crow flies, yes, but not, not a direct path for sure. All right, and now Bethel is what kind of town? Okay, so Israel set up false worship there. All right, they set it up in Bethel. There was another town parallel to Bethel that was also in the nation of Israel in the north. Does anybody know for an extra point bonus? what that town was. No. Dan. Yeah, so yeah, so you had Bethel at the bottom, you had Dan at the top, you had Samaria right there in the whole area and region that was also looking to um, do their own type of worship in their own way. So um, Amos went with a very specific message. Now, uh, let's see, if you remember, what does Amos mean? Burden. burden or burden bearer. Amos is typically, when you look at the Hebrew, it's Amos. 
And so Amos is a burden bearer. He has a burden to carry to the nation of Israel. Now, when we think about the nation of Israel, is it the complete nation or is it a, you have a what kingdom and a what kingdom? Northern. Northern? and then a southern kingdom named Judah. So northern kingdom Israel, which is where Amos went, but he's from Tekoa, which is in the region of Judah. All right, so now as we looked last week, Amos proclaimed, or two weeks ago, Amos proclaimed a message to six outlying regions, right? And those six outlying regions um, each kind of did what was right in their own eyes, and so Amos proclaimed judgment. And then as soon as Amos was done proclaiming judgment to those six outlying regions, where did he focus his interest in after that? Not yet. Judah. Very good. So he had a message to Judah. And so if you look in Amos chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, you will find his message to Judah. And what, was the, uh, what were the sins that the nation of Judah committed right there? Very important, they rejected the law of the Lord. And so they chose to also do what was right in their own eyes, ignore the law of the Lord that was given to them in what? Ten Commandments and also the first what? Five books also called the Torah. Torah. Okay, so, all right, so good. So we're, we're beginning to tie these things together uh, in scripture so that you can kind of see how everything's laid out um, as we go through so that's good so after Judah then where did Amos turn his attention Israel correct and so he ended up with Israel now out of all of those eight areas that Amos mentioned are any of them going to be saved no no None of them are going to be saved. So that means they're all going to be destroyed in some shape, form, or fashion. Such a positive message. Um, so again, why the prophets were very popular. Um, and so uh, when we look at these messages, they're all very specific. All right. Now, when we look at the book of Amos, the book of Amos is divided really into four distinct types of items. So the first two items in the book of Amos are really just clear revelations. So chapter 1 and 2 are nothing more than revelations of things that are going to come. Chapters 3, 4, 5, and 6 are the messages or the sermons that Amos is now going to focus in on to the nation of Israel. So now Amos is getting zeroed in very seriously as we begin in chapter 3 with these messages toward the nation of Israel. The next group has to do with the last three chapters, so 7, 8, and 9, and that is visions. And so we'll talk about that when we get to that section. And then at the very end of chapter 9 is the fourth section really that you could divide the book of Amos in and that particular section is referred to really as the promises and so throughout God's word even though the prophets had to deliver a very specific and very important message God always provides a hope and a message for those that have put their faith and trust in him and so we'll see that but it might take us a few weeks to get there, okay? So good news is coming, right? So, all right. So we're going to go to Amos chapter 3, and like I did last week, we're going to read through the whole chapter, and then I'll come back, and we'll kind of break this apart uh, in chapter, we're starting in chapter 3, and we'll see um, exactly what the message is for the nation of Israel. So we'll start chapter 3, verse 1 of Amos, and it says... Hear this word, the Lord has spoken against you, O people of Israel, against the whole family I brought up out of Egypt. You only have I chosen of all the families of the earth, therefore I will punish you 
for all your sins. Do two walk together unless they have agreed to do so? Or does a lion roar in the thicket when he has no prey? Does he growl in his den when he has caught nothing? Does a bird fall into a trap on the ground where no snare has been set? Does a trap spring up from the earth when there is nothing to catch? When a trumpet sounds in a city, do not the people tremble? And when disaster comes to a city, has not the Lord caused it? Surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. The lion has roared, who will not fear? The sovereign Lord has spoken, but who can prophesy? Proclaim to the fortresses of Ashdod and to the fortresses of Egypt. Assemble yourselves on the mountains of Samaria and see the great unrest within her and the oppression among her people. They do not know how to do right, declares the Lord, who hoard and plunder and loot in their fortresses. Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says, an enemy will overrun the land, and he will put down your strongholds and plunder your fortresses. This is what the Lord says, a shepherd saves from the lion's mouth, only two leg bones or a piece of an ear, so will the Israelites be saved. Those who sit in Samaria on the edge of their beds and in Damascus on their couches, hear this and testify against the house of Jacob, declares the Lord, the God Almighty. On the day I punish Israel for her sins, I will destroy the altars of Bethel. The horns of the altar will be cut off and will fall to the ground. I will tear down the winter house along with the summer house, and the houses adorned with ivory will be destroyed, and the mansions will be demolished, declares the Lord. You may look at that passage and go, man, there's a whole lot of destruction and doom and gloom, and as I've said before, the message of the prophets, which is why you probably don't find a whole lot of preachers talking about the prophets, but the message of the prophets are timely. They were timely to the people of the nation of Israel just as much as they are timely for us today. And in order for us to understand what's coming for us, we look back at the message that the Lord had from the prophets at this time. So let's back up and let's look at verses 1 and 2 specifically here. Uh, so we'll go back to verses 1 and 2, and it says, Hear this word that the Lord, uh, hear this word, people of Israel, the word the Lord has spoken against you, against the whole family. I brought you up out of Egypt. Only you have I chosen of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your sins. So when you look at this in verse 1 specifically, he says, against the whole family. So he's giving Israel a warning at this point, but what is he really talking about here? When he says, hear this word of the Lord, that he has spoken against you, O people of Israel, against the whole family. What do you think he's talking about there? Correct. So when we talk about the whole family... And where do we get that? That's correct. So where do we get that reference from? Lynn, if you'll pull back up verse 1 for me. How do we know he's talking about, Amos is talking about the whole nation of Israel, both Israel and Judah? Correct. So there's a reference point there. And the Lord gave Amos that very specific reference point to let them know that, look, I'm not now just addressing this little northern kingdom of Israel, I have a message here where I'm addressing the whole family. Have you ever been pulled into a family conference? And it wasn't just one person that was pulled into that family conference. It was the whole family. Now, I'm not going to ask you to testify as to what happened during a family conference. 
because what happens in the conference stays in the conference. But this is that similar type tone where now Amos is addressing all of Israel, both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And that reference is put in there because he says, I have brought you up out of Egypt. Verse 2, if we go that, it says, You only have I chosen of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your sins. What does he mean in this passage, do you think? Okay, so NLT says, and I read that. So NLT says, I have been intimate with you alone, therefore that is why I must punish you. But again, what does that mean? Do we think? Okay, so there was a covenant against the, with the whole nation as a whole, Right, And so he chose this nation. So now, to know how he chose this nation, who do we go all the way back to? Who is the covenant that he made? Who do you make it with? Abraham. Abraham. So he called Abraham out of the land of Ur and told Abraham, hey, pick up all your stuff and go to a land that I will show you. We go all the way back to Genesis to take a look at that. So in Genesis, he's given this declaration, and over time what we begin to see through that is, hey, the Lord has a purpose, the Lord has a plan, he's made a covenant with Abraham that the nation will be many, and so with this particular proclamation, as he pulls it up there in verse 2, it's very clear that he's addressing the whole nation, and not only that, he is now addressing the covenant that was made and because the nation of Israel sinned against the Lord, you're now going to be punished. So now here's my question. The other part of this verse, when he says, Therefore I will punish you for all your sins. How many of you have ever had a parent as you were growing up say, This is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you? No? There's one out of the bunch, right? So the Lord is not necessarily saying this is going to hurt me, but what the Lord is really saying is, is that I didn't want to do this. I didn't want to do this from the beginning. But you chose not to listen. You chose to go in these surrounding regions that we have talked about, these regions of Moab and these regions of the Amorites and all these and the Philistines, all of these areas... You chose not to listen to me. You chose to go into those countries. And because you went into those countries, you were influenced by the false gods, the false teachers, the false doctrines, all of that stuff. And not only were you influenced, but you have now brought it back into my regions, the land that I gave you. And it didn't just happen to the northern kingdom, it happened to the southern kingdom. Has the Lord shown us that in this world today? The Lord gave us a nation that we're in today that was founded upon Christian principles. Despite what the history books say today in modern history and what they teach in school, I'm telling you, this country has been a Christian nation founded on Christian principles, and now we're in the same boat because we as a people have not listened to the Word of God. We've not followed the Word of God. And so now, <laughs> what Amos is telling the nation of Israel can be overlaid to what he is now telling us. Because we're going to be seeing that we have broken our belief in God as a country. Now luckily, there's a remnant we can talk about that later, um, but there is a remnant as we go through that. So when we look at these particular verses um, and we look at these particular items in verses 1 and 2, it's important for us to remember that God is also punishing the nation of Israel because he held them to a higher standard. 
let me ask you this question. For those of us that have put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we read his word, we study his word, we're supposed to follow his word, do you think the accountability is greater on us as Christians for not following God's word than it would be for somebody who had never heard God's word. Now hear me say, if you've never heard God's word, you're going to get a free pass to heaven. That is not what I'm saying. What I am saying is quite the opposite. For those of us that know better, but don't do better, the accountability is on us, and we are much more accountable for our actions than a nation that did not listen, a people that did not listen, a person that did not listen to the Lord. To whom much is given, much is required. And so we are all accountable, but as we have grown in the Lord, studying His Word, we should know better. But we don't. The nation of Israel finds themselves in the same boat. And so the Lord is telling them right there in verse 2, because I had a covenant with you, because you knew better, because I had a relationship with you, and you still chose to sin, you are now going to have to pay the price. You're going to have to go through judgment. That's the first two verses. So then let's look on, all right? Let's look on at verse 3, if we will. Let's go ahead and go to verse 3. It says, Do two walk together unless they have agreed to do so? Does a lion roar in the thicket when he has no prey? Does he growl in his den when he has caught nothing? Does a bird fall, on a trap, fall into a trap on the ground when no snare has been set? And does a trap spring up from the earth? When there is nothing to catch, when the trumpet sounds in a city, do not the people tremble? And when disaster comes to a city, has not the Lord caused it? Surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. For the lion has roared, who will not hear? And the sovereign Lord has spoken, but who, I'm sorry, but who can but prophesy? So in this section of question, in this passage here, we're presented with a number of questions. What do you think the purpose is, if you look at verses 3 through 6, what do you think the purpose is for these questions? Okay, so he's getting their attention. You're saying he's, he's asking these questions supposedly to help make them think. Okay, what else? Why else do you think? What is he doing? What's the purpose of these questions? Okay, so rhetorical questions, right? Okay, so I would agree. They're rhetorical type questions. Uh, have you ever been, so if you have been a parent, um, or think back to when your parents might have questioned you, do you think there is a time when they ever asked you a question that they didn't already know the answer to? Well, they thought they did. Well, the kids may have thought they, yeah, but the, as the parent, I'm typically not going to ask my kids a question that is an important question unless I know the answer to that question before I sit down with them, all right? My guess is you've been in that same boat or you have asked questions in that same boat. The same is true here, right? These are rhetorical questions. Um, so is Amos expecting the nation here to give an answer to these questions if they're rhetorical? A absolutely not. He's not giving a room. He's not giving any room, really. He's going through and saying, hey, look, do two people walk together unless they've agreed to do so? So when you think about that question, is there a manner, he's talking about a relationship here, and can two people 
agree to walk together and go down the same path if they have a difference of opinion? Could they do that? Uh huh. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, I would agree. And I would agree that the Lord's using imagery here to represent that, to say, hey, look, you're not going to walk down the street with somebody unless you're in agreement. You're not going to get along unless you can, can find some agreement there. By the way, we're not going to really walk in fellowship, Israel, unless we're in agreement and unless you've gotten this relationship right. We, um, you know, a lion's not going to roar in the thicket if he doesn't have any prey. That would be... You know, a lion is one, if you've ever watched a, a lion, does a lion roar before he pounces? Uh, typically, no, it's after he pounces. So there's just, what Amos is doing is he's drawing commonality for the people to understand exactly what's going on here. He's trying to say, hey, look, these types of questions, of course you're not going to do this, and of course you're not going to do that, and of course this isn't going to happen. The same is true in the relationship that you're supposed to have with me. We can't move forward until you repent of your sins. We can't move forward until you ask forgiveness of your sins. And by the way, there's still some consequences because you have sinned. Um, he goes on right there in verse 6. This is an interesting imagery here that says, When a trumpet sounds in a city, do not the people tremble. What does, what does a trumpet sounding in a city typically represent? A warning? Right, so a warning is coming. And so when that warning comes, what do the people typically do? Nine times out of ten, run for cover. So in today's world, if we're here in the tornado alley and you hear a tornado siren, typically people get their, their heart starts to beat. They're like, oh my goodness, is this real? Is a tornado coming? You got people on their phone watching the radar going, well, it may skirt by, but I don't know. The other natural response would also be that you need to do what? Duck and cover, protect yourself, right? And so when we think about this imagery and the trumpet that sounds, how would people be able to protect themselves when you look at the last part of that verse that says, when disaster comes to a city, has not the Lord caused it? How do you protect yourself from that? Or can you? Yeah. Faith in Jesus Christ. Uh -huh. You have full protection. Protection is not simply awareness. Protection is eternity. Where you're going to spend eternity. Right. Before you're protected from being with evil ones, aims between people for eternity. So for us today, yep, Christ is that protection for us. Absolutely. So Christ is our protector in today's world. Now, does that mean that, that we're going to be protected from all calamity that may happen? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But we still have hope in Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. And we still look to him as our refuge and our strength uh, and our ever-present help in time of need um, with that. When you look at this verse, though, I think Amos is continuing to tell the folks, look, when the trumpet sounds and disaster's coming... It's because I, the Lord, am causing that. And the reason the Lord's causing that is a part of his judgment on the nation of Israel. Verse 7 and 8. It's 
So if we go back to 7 and 8, it says, Surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to the servants, the prophets. The lion has roared, who will not fear? The sovereign Lord has spoken, but who can prophesy? When I look at this particular verse, <clears throat> we're going to go back for just a minute. If you'll think all the way back to the first Wednesday night of August, and we start talking about this profile of a prophet. Remember, we talked specifically that the prophets sometimes are given messages that we may not understand. So while we are here serving the Lord, the Lord may not reveal all of the secrets to us that are within his mind. So if you're looking, let's go back to Deuteronomy. You don't have to turn there. I'll have it pull up. But Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 29. Just remember it says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may follow all the words of this law. The first part of that verse is very clear that there are secret things that still belong to the Lord. If you look forward in the New Testament, it talks about the mysteries of the Lord. These are things that the Lord knows and he chooses to reveal to the prophets at a certain time to deliver a certain message. So when you take this verse in Deuteronomy and now you overlay that, understanding what the prophet's responsibility is, surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets which is why Amos or any other prophet could speak so boldly. It's because the Lord has revealed the secrets that only he knows to Amos or to Isaiah or to Hosea or to Jeremiah or any of the other prophets. And so when the Lord does that, he is confirming both with the nation of Israel and with Amos that, look, I'm going to reveal to you my word, and by the way, when I give you my word, you're going to repeat my word to the people that need to hear it. And then it's the parallel to verse 6. Verse 8 says, The lion has roared, who will not fear? The trumpet has sounded, and now the people are going to tremble. And then it says, The sovereign Lord has spoken, but who can prophesy? Only those that the Lord has given that message to to go and deliver can be the ones to prophesy. And when that message is delivered, it brings about God's judgment on that nation. So verse 6 and 8, at least in my studies, um, to me have a parallel. The parallel, the trumpet sound to the lion roar, the people who fear but yet, the Lord is the one who really reveals the words to the prophets, which brings judgment and destruction. Moving forward, verses 9 and 10. Proclaim to the fortresses of Ashdod and to the fortresses of Egypt, assemble yourselves on the mountains of Samaria, see the great unrest within her and the oppression among her people. They do not know how to do right, declares the Lord, who hoard, plunder, and loot their fortresses. So when we look at this particular passage, what significance do you think the nation of Egypt may have? Why are we talking about Egypt and Ashdod? Egypt's had a rich history with the nation of Israel. What's the history that Egypt has with Israel? Right, so it goes all the way back to Joseph. So we go back to uh, the last third of Genesis, so to speak, and you see and hear the story of Joseph. 
Um, and Joseph was basically, his brothers sold him, um, and he went to Egypt. He worked for Potiphar. He was thrown into jail, but the Lord gave him a very specific skill, few, several skill sets, but one that's revealed is that he can interpret dreams, and so he interpreted a dream. He told the baker, hey, if you can remember this, when you go and will serve the king as the cupbearer, then you please remember that. So as things would have it, Pharaoh had a dream. Nobody could interpret it. The cupbearer's like, hey, I remember this guy in prison that could interpret dreams. Uh, he might could interpret yours. And so Joseph came, basically interpreted the dream, told Pharaoh what was going to happen, about the five or the seven fat cows and the seven skinny cows and how there was going to be plenty of food for seven years and all of a sudden there was going to be a huge drought that was going to take place. And so he told Pharaoh all this. Pharaoh in turn makes him second in command in all the land of Egypt. God's provision over his people, God still keeping his covenant over his people that they would remain protected. And so as a part of that protection... And as a part of that relationship, basically the nation of Israel, when you look at um, the brothers of Joseph, and they all are able, and able to go down, live in Egypt, and through that, though, for 400 years, from the time they went to live in Egypt to the end of a 400-year period, they became slaves in Egypt and started working for the pharaohs at that particular point, building whatever they chose to have them built. Then Moses comes on the scene, delivers them from the land of Egypt, but when he delivers them from the land of Egypt, what do they do? The Israelites gripe, complain. Man, we always had it great over there under Pharaoh. At least we knew what we were doing. Now we're out here wandering in the wilderness. Lord, are you sure you know what you're doing? I don't think the Lord knows what he's doing. Do you think the Lord knows what he's He doesn't know what he's doing? And so they gripe and complain. And because of that, and because they chose not to listen, they got to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And it was during that point in time of ebbing and flowing and listening to the Lord and not listening to the Lord that they remember their time back in Egypt many times. And they're like, man, we had it good in Egypt, but then we were slaves. And man, we had it good in Egypt, but then we were slaves. So there's been a rich history with the nation of Egypt. Now, when we talk about Ashdod and Egypt here, Egypt at this particular point has become basically a nation that has become rich and prosperous up until this point in time. We go back to verse 9, so let's take a look at verse 9, if we can. Have you pull that up? Proclaim to the fortresses of Ashdod and the fortresses of Egypt. And so what we're saying here, or what Amos is saying here, is that I'm giving you a message that's going to be heard all across the land. And all these other nations that are looking at you because you put your trust in me, Israel, are going to see that I'm a righteous and just God. And so I want you, Israel, to take note of what's going to happen because all these other countries are now going to see what happens when you don't listen to the Lord. So I want to proclaim to the fortresses of Ashdod in the north and the fortresses of Egypt in the south, and I want them to see and assemble what's going to happen within my own people and the oppression that's going to happen, not just to you, but is going to spread to all these other countries and regions because they also did not follow and listen to the Lord. And so utter destruction across the region. The Assyrians come in, um, and you know that a lot of folks were carried off to Babylon, and so there's a period of captivity, all because they chose not to listen. And Amos is telling them it's a little too late for what's going on here. Next verse, verse 10 it goes on to say then, they do not know how to do right. So we're going now, as we're proclaiming to these nations, and as people are looking at these nations, and these nations are looking at Israel, Amos twists just a moment to say, not only do you not know how to do right, 
but these other nations no longer how to do right either. And so while I'm proclaiming to you, I'm also proclaiming to these other people who have their own fortresses, and they're going to look, and they're going to see what happens. They also are ones who store up in their fortresses what they've plundered and looted. Now, that refers back to what we talked about in the beginning of chapter 2 of Amos, end of 1, beginning of 2, where we look at what all these other regions had done. They'd looted, they'd plundered, they'd sold people into slavery, actually whole communities, whole regions they sold into slavery. Um, and so now there's a clearer picture as to what the Lord's telling not only Israel, pay attention, these other countries aren't going to get away with it either, but I'm going to proclaim to them so they can see what also happens to the nation that does trust me and chooses to turn away from me. So there's a lot in that particular passage. Let's go to verse 11. Therefore, this is what the Lord, sovereign Lord, says. An enemy will overrun your land, pull down your strongholds, plunder your fortresses. This is what the Lord says. As a shepherd rescues from the lion's mouth only two leg bones or a piece of an ear, so will the Israelites living in Samaria be rescued with only a head of a bed and a piece of fabric from a couch. Now I'm going to pause right there for a second. When we look at this, Amos is using an example that he knows because Amos's profession, again, is what? He's a shepherd. So he's now relating to the people in Bethel that, hey, I, I, again, I'm a shepherd. I'm just here proclaiming what the Lord told me to proclaim. But I want you to be aware that just as a shepherd is going to go and do its best to rescue a sheep who has been devoured almost by a lion, when they get there, there's not going to be much left. It's a picture of a remnant to me, meaning that God is going to have just a very few people left that truly, truly trust and believe in him. There are false prophets all over the place, teaching all kind of false truths, and I use that word loosely, um, because people aren't grounded in God's word. And one of the worst things that could happen is, is that you have somebody that's proclaiming a half-biblical truth that may sound all true, and they choose to follow that. So when that happens, you end up with just a few pieces that's left because there's not much going on. So the Israelites living in Samaria, um, will the, so will the Israelites living in Samaria be rescued with only the head of a bed and a piece of fabric from a couch. So what are those, what are those folks going to have left? Not much. Not much at all. But they have hope in the Lord and they're going to be rescued. Next, let's go to the next one there, 13. So hear this and testify against the descendants of Jacob, declares the Lord, the Lord God Almighty. On the day I punish Israel for her sins, I will destroy the altars of Bethel. The horns of the altar will be cut off and fall to the ground. I will tear down the winter house along with the summer house the houses adorned with ivory will be destroyed and the mansions will be demolished, declares the Lord. The nation of Israel has taken full advantage of people within their own country and people outside of their own country. And so when it talks about, I'm going to tear down their summer house, I'm going to tear down their winter house. He's talking about people, and we looked at it last week, but he's talking about people who have taken advantage of other people. You know, in today's world, the richer get rich and the poorer get poorer. This is just the case as it was in Bethel, in Dan, in Samaria, in the northern kingdom particularly. This is what was going on. They created their own false gods. They worshipped their own false gods. They worshipped the Baals. 
and again that's a golden and they put it in the image of a golden calf that goes all the way back to where where's the first time we hear about a golden calf Aaron, Aaron right and Aaron is doing what is Aaron's brother who is Aaron's brother Moses, Moses. and what is Moses doing getting the Ten Commandments, getting the Ten Commandments. And so Aaron is, Moses has been up on the mount for a long time. Aaron's like, my brother's not coming back. And so they begin to build their own false gods, worship in their own way. They build this golden calf. Moses shows up, and this is what I find funny. What does Aaron say when Moses shows up? That's right, exactly what Aaron said. Aaron, or Moses, Aaron's like, Moses, I don't know how this got here. I just threw this gold in the fire. All of a sudden, it out pops this cow, this golden calf. I'm like, yeah, it's just start again. But so that's. But those images, those false gods, have plagued the nation of Israel all the way up to this point. And God's saying, look, I'm going to get rid of those false altars that you're praying at and these false things that you're doing. We're going to cut the horns off. We're going to get rid of them because you have chosen not to listen to the Lord. You know, God has a message for us, even in all this destruction, and that is for us to be mindful and keep our eyes open on the truth that is in His Word, not the truth that is in man's Word. Because as we're seeing, and we will continue to see, the nation of Israel has taken their eyes off of God and they have put their trust in what other cultures say is right, other countries, regions, people, what they say is right. And now because of that, they're going to suffer the judgment. We should be so careful ourselves in what we read, what we listen to, what we watch on TV, what we hear around the water cooler, what we encounter, we should be so careful so that we don't fall into that same trap that the Israelites have fallen into at this point in time. That's correct. That's what I'm saying, yeah. We should be so careful as to make sure when we're standing on a foundation that our foundation is found on a biblical foundation and not man's. And that our truth is not what we want truth to be, but that our truth is founded in what God's Word said it should be. Even as Christians, we'll fall for that every time if we're not in God's Word. That's right. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you tonight and we thank you so much for who you are. Again, uh, not a popular message for the nation of Israel. But as we continue to dig in the book of Amos, we're going to continue to see more parallels that the nation of Israel isn't the only one that has chosen to follow their own path and turn their eyes from you. Father, we as a country have done the same thing here in the United States. We have chosen to follow our own path, our own way, make our own gods and worship how we want to worship, who we want to worship, where we want to worship. And Father, that's not what your word tells us. Your word tells us that Christ is the only way. He is the truth and the light and the only way to the Father. So, Father, tonight, may we not be found standing on the word of man, listening and believing what we hear and see and what other people are saying. But, Father, may we stay true to your word. May we stay humbled by your word. 
May we stay in your word so that we can recognize the truth from the lie. And Father, may we uh, help our fellow brothers and sisters uh, in this journey, in this walk, uh, so that we can all um, keep our eyes on Christ and what he has done for us. For this world's done nothing for us, but Christ gave his all for everyone so that we could be found forgiven. All we have to do is repent of our sins, turn the other way, and Father, proclaim you loudly, get into your word and study. And Father, I ask now that as we, uh, this week, have an opportunity to open up your word and study, that we would take advantage of that so that we can t continue to know the truth that is only found in you. In thy name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, give me a minute, and we're going to take prayer requests real quickly.